Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's been a great pleasure. Welcome to the program, Doug Surrett, who's Chief Product Strategist at Blue Jay Solutions. And today, we're going to talk about four major influences on supply chains for 2019. Now, one of the things that you know defines supply chain management is the rapid pace of change that's happening across you know virtually all dimensions. You know, the, the competitive landscape, regulations, technology, and and so forth. So you know, keeping a pulse on these trends and changes is, you know, more important than ever in order to make sure that you're as prepared as possible to, you know, navigate through whatever future, you know, whatever the future holds uh, not in the months and years ahead here. So uh, in today's program, we're going to talk about some of these trends. And uh, it's great to have uh, Doug in the program to share his uh, uh, insights and advice on, on these trends. So uh, Doug, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Adrian. It's good to be back with you. Always enjoy these. Yeah, that's no, great. And, you know, we're, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that 2019 is, uh, you know, around the corner here. So, uh, it's, you know, it's a good timing to kind of start looking ahead and, and uh, looking at some of these things and, and how they might impact, you know, the operations of, of, of companies. Um, you know, so, so let's start with a topic that really has dominated the headlines this year. And that is all of the changes that are impacting, you know, global supply chains, everything from, you know, new tariffs to new trade agreements to, you know, Brexit, which is kind of back in the headlines again, you know, recently. I mean, how, how are these changing, you know, changes, you know, impacting, you know, the companies that you're, you know, working with and, and kind of what's the outlook for 2019 with regards to global trade? Yeah, good, good question. So uh, we, you know, we have customers that are, are all over the world and, you know, customers in the U.S., for example, that are impacted by the tariffs, you know, on again, off again, kind of, kind of dynamic, which is, uh, is always interesting. Uh, we've got a, a good number of customers in the U.K. that are, uh, you know, trying to figure out what does Brexit mean and how does it impact them. And we have customers that are EU clients who are not in the U.K. but are shipping to the U.K. and they're also struggling with some of these same things. Um, uh, and let's maybe just talk about Brexit just for a moment, uh, just to give you some statistics. Uh, depending on the final uh, sort of outcome of the Brexit negotiations, it could be it could be quite simple or it could be quite difficult for traders. Um, and the you know the the sort of quite difficult scenario uh, today, the the HMRC, which is the UK's uh, revenue uh, ministry, if you will, has essentially estimated that. If there is a what we like to think of as a hard Brexit, there's almost 200,000 companies in the UK alone that will have to start submitting uh, declarations that today don't have to submit declarations. Um, and when you look at other countries that are heavy trading partners with the UK, there's similar kinds of numbers. So if you're a Dutch company, for example, shipping goods into the UK, today there's a, a, a whole swath of that commerce that's not subject to uh, declarations that tomorrow would be if, if Brexit is indeed a hard Brexit. So our customers are really anxious to understand what is the final form of Brexit going to be because it has a significant material impact on what they have to do. Uh, the UK government has finally, I would say, um, recognized this and, and effectively has set aside money for industry to start investing in technology solutions to help them facilitate uh, the declaration process because they recognize that uh, they don't have the manpower even to handle, let's say the you know the the non-automated means of submitting declarations. And just for uh, viewers of this session, um, you don't have to use a, a solution in the UK to submit a declaration. But what effectively you you can do is send uh, send the information to UK Customs and they'll key it in for you. And they clearly don't want to be keying in, you know, two hundred thousand companies customs declarations tomorrow. So they're uh, they're incentivizing the industry you know, by by way of sort of financial aid, if you will, to to invest in technology, um, and and that's starting to you know starting to to that news is starting to get out there for for customers, um, but it's it's a big area of concern, you know, quite honestly, and um, ultimately at the end of the day, it's a responsibility of, of companies like Blue Jay to be uh, prepared for either scenario, no matter which way it goes. Um, but it has it has a very real impact on the trading community um, in the U.S. Of course, we're in a little different situation. We're not maybe facing kind of the significant, uh, let's say, cliff that that a Brexit kind of scenario presents. But but we have the same kind of dynamic with, and we went through this with the tariffs for, for example, the steel tariffs and 
and the, the, the new tariffs in Turkey and the, the, you know, the changes to the NAFTA agreements and so on. All of those things have to be reacted to fairly quickly um, with any kind of a technology solution so that the customers that are using those solutions aren't in a position now of being in violation of, of U.S. law as soon as those, those changes are enacted. So, uh, so for, for customers of Blue Jay, you know, they're, they're getting these regular updates and they're okay. Um, but, you know, you have to be on a good technology platform that is maintaining and actively monitoring all of these changes in real time and, and getting them into the software so that the customers are taken care of. Um, you know, the, the, the Turkish tariff scenario is one that's particularly interesting for us. We had, uh, we had those, you know, literally updated the, the next day. And so all of our customers were, were in really good shape. But, um, but again, it's, it's recognizing that if you don't have some kind of a technology solution, you have to really be on top of these changes. And you, as, a, as an organization, you have to be able to react very, very quickly and disseminate that, that requirement to all of the individuals that are responsible for making these, uh, you know, these shipments in compliance with the, the regulation. So it's a challenge. Um, I, I like to think that, you know, a good software solution and good software provider can help mitigate a lot of that. Um, at the end of the day, though, you still have to know what's going on. And uh, even the best tool in the hands of the wrong person isn't, isn't really going to help that person very much. So, so you, you ha clearly have to stay up on the changes. But at the same time, it's really important to be partnered with a good technology provider who makes sure at least that the logic is up to date as soon as, uh, as, soon as those changes are enacted. So we see a lot of fear and uncertainty, quite honestly. Uh, I would say primarily in the UK market and EU around what is the final uh, Brexit package going to look like. And uh, so we're you know, obviously doing our best to assure customers that at least if you're working with us today, you're going to be in good shape. Um, if you're not working with us, make sure that whoever you're working with is, is on top of the changes and, and moving forward. And then just for good measure in the UK, uh, the, the UK government has also decided to swap out the back end system that, uh, or replace an old system, let's say, that is the back end of their current customs platform. And so, you know, while Brexit is happening, they're also, you know, trying to, trying to swap out the engine of the aircraft, which has is, is made it quite interesting for those, those people in the UK. So lots of challenges. And again, it's important to make sure that you're partnered with somebody that is set up and equipped to handle those and, and can adapt to them in, in really in real time. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, what, you know, and I think Brexit is a good example, uh, you know, as you talked about, I mean, I think what I hear a lot from companies is, um, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty right now, whether it's with Brexit, whether it's with, you know, what's going to happen with the China tariffs, you know, here with the U S and, and what's happening there and that continues to escalate in, in, in many ways or what you know what's going to happen with you know the the new nafta agreement which which i guess is now usmca um but but the bottom line is that it's very hard for companies to make you know decisions uh whether with sourcing decisions or how they're going to set up uh, you know their um you know the operating systems if you will to to react to these things until there's some certainty one one way or another and then I think to your point, and then then the, the reality is that uh, you know once uh, you know the, the things are finalized, uh, you know some of these things you, you know have to get rolled out you know relatively quickly, and you know so uh, you know being um, as proactive as possible in terms of understanding what the potential impacts are going to be and 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 making sure that you're prepared not only from a uh, uh, you know, understanding the impact standpoint, but also from a technology standpoint, because ultimately, you know, like you said, the last thing you want to do is, you know, be hand keying, you know, information or using spreadsheets to manage a lot of this stuff, which unfortunately I know, you know, in, in over the years that I've done research around global trade management systems and solutions, you know, there's still a lot of, uh, of, uh, these processes that are still managed with spreadsheets and, and people doing things, you know, manually, which is, is, you know, very risky and, you know, in, in, in this environment. Um, well, well, speaking of, of kind of automating, you know, processes, trying to, trying to simplify things. I mean, I, I think on the one hand, you know, global trade is becoming more risky and, and complex as, as we just talked about. But on the other hand, I mean, there are efforts to, you know, actually streamline some of the processes involved with moving goods across borders. And, and one of those things that is kind of the single window environment in, in, the, in the EU, uh, certainly there's something similar here in the, in, in the United States. Um, you know, for people who are not familiar with, you know, single window, you know, what is it? And then, you know, how will it influence supply chains in, in 2019 and beyond? 
Yeah, so uh, real simply, uh, the, the single window um, concept is, uh, you know, it, it, you, we've got all these different, let's say, governmental agencies that, and, and non-governmental agencies and organizations that are all participants in the supply chain process. Uh, so, for example, let's take a typical air freight shipment. Uh, you know, you're going to have the airlines, you're going to have maybe a freight forwarder, you're going to have certainly a customs broker, you're going to have the customs authority. If it's of a particular type of shipment, you might have another governmental agency that's involved. And in, in sort of days gone by in the past, a lot of these uh, participants were interacting on disparate, sometimes disconnected technology. And so the, the EU actually uh, several years ago came together and said, listen, we want to establish kind of a single window concept and, and actually turned it into a mandate for all the EU countries that they would implement a single solution that provided the kind of the visibility and information sharing for all these different participants. So if you were the freight forwarder, for example, you could participate in and, and contribute to the information flow in the same way that the customs broker could and so on. And if you wanted to go see one uh, view of the information, it was the same view no matter you know, which, which participant you were. And then, and then other processes would spawn off of that. Like for instance, if you needed to go obtain a particular governmental license to do a certain import or export, you could go to this kind of single window and also start to, uh, you know, participate in these services to request licenses and have them granted and that sort of thing. So the idea was really meant to be kind of a one-stop shop for all of the trade community and the customs community and everybody else to come together and share information. Um, now, what that, that has meant, though, is that a lot of the back-end software solutions that are used by the various governmental organizations uh, now also need to be replaced. Uh, and for those of our listeners who are in the U.S. who uh, do any kind of uh, global trade are very familiar with the, uh, let's say, the significant uh, energy that was put into the ACE replacement project some years ago and still, to some degree, ongoing. Um, and what has been the outcome of that, of course, is one by one, these sort of little one-off silo applications have been shut down and, and uh, everything has been moving into the, the single platform. So you have that same kind of thing happening in Europe. It's actually also starting to happen throughout Asia as well. And it, what it ultimately has meant is that as these back-end systems are replaced, then the front-end, you know, let's say the, the portal applications that connect to those have to be updated and, and now um, compliant, made compliant with these new backends. And then uh, one of the other dynamics that's come out of that is it, it, just in the EU in particular, the, the, the sort of the old legacy customs applications were heavily built around uh, the Edifact EDI message framework. And so, you know, that technology has been out there for a very long time. And while it served its purpose, it's also quite inflexible. And so a lot of these uh, governments have, have recognized if we're going to go through the pain of replacing the system uh, to comply with the, the single window mandate, well, let's go ahead and make it more modern and let's, you know, let's use XML as opposed to Edifact. And of course, again, that's, that's meant more and more change for the trade community that's connected to these systems. So um, all, all of these are good things. I think in the end, it's, it's, it's really enabling the industry to be in a better position to share information. Uh, there's even some talk in some countries about uh, if, if we could put the customs information, let's say, by virtue of a, of, of a TMS transaction, for example, I could put the customs information just into some application, maybe now the customs authority could reach into that and create the declaration out of that data. Now, we're, we're not in a place yet where that's a reality, but I think that's ultimately one of the objectives of a single window concept is that these, these various information consumers uh, or processors can sort of reach into this data and get it out of there rather than have to have it all packaged up and bundled and transmitted to them directly. So again, those are, those are things that aren't quite a reality yet, but those become benefits of, of a single window system down the road. So would, um, would that be done via like APIs and, you know, have something? Yeah. So I, I almost think of it as sort of like a big data lake. You know, I, I've created a shipment, it's coming out of the TMS and I just capture, make sure that I capture all the information that would be needed for a customs declaration. And when I dump that record, that shipment record into the data lake at some point, you know, this is, let's say it's a shipment going from Norway to Finland. Now the Norwegian government could go in there and, and, you know, pull out what they need, the, 
the Finnish government can go in there and pull out what they need, and both you know both uh, organizations are happy. Uh, rather than uh, which the process today, which is I formulate the a subset of that data into a very specific structure that I'm sending to the Norwegian government, and then I formulate it again in a different format to send to the Finnish government. So. The, the single window system is a huge step forward uh, in, in a lot of ways, but it is also laying the foundation for, for more, I would say, strategic opportunities in the future where it's less about creating structured data in exactly the format needed at exactly the moment it's needed by the participant in the supply chain and rather putting it into a place where anybody sort of with the right credentials and the right role can go in and get that information out when they need it. Now, there's a lot of talk around you know, the application of blockchain in the global trade arena. Do, do you see this being yeah. part of, of, of that dynamic, uh, you know, uh, whether in the near term or the longer term? It's one, it's one of the technologies that's been kind of explored for this exact purpose, uh, to, to become kind of that backbone for this uh, you know, data lake, I'll use that term, it's the wrong term, but it gives you the, the visual idea of, of, of data that can just be consumed by different participants. And, and if it's in a secured, uh, let's say, um, undistortable kind of record, then, you know, then, then of course, it, there's a lot of value in doing that. And blockchain is, is designed very well for that. Um, and since you mentioned blockchain, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of other initiatives, of course, around blockchain these days. Uh, but, it, you know, that's one that, that feels like a really good use of the technology. And, and a number of these countries are starting to explore that as the actual backbone for that. So, uh, so yeah, we do, we, we're definitely seeing that. And I think you're going to see more of that develop in other areas as well. Uh, some that we're looking at, which I can't speak about right now, but, uh, you know, things that are where you need a single source of truth that is sort of, you know, unchangeable, undistortable, un, uh, unalterable, if you will. Uh, and, and that information has to pass through a number of different hands until it gets to the final step in the process and be, be consistent and unbroken. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's definitely some, some good opportunities for that. So, so where is, where is, where is single window right now, you know, in, in terms of, is it at the early stages and middle stages? Is it, you know, in the later stages? Yeah, it's, I would say it's in the later stages. The European mandate, if my memory is correct, was originally to have all of this in place for all the EU countries by 2020. They have pushed that out a little bit because they know that's, that's probably not going to happen. Um, what is fascinating to me is that a lot of the countries that have, um, uh, let's say been doing customs, electronic customs the longest are the ones that have the hardest time making the transition because they've built up all of these legacy systems that kind of now, it's not just kind of building one new system, it's, you know, replacing 17 backend systems. Uh, so the, the, let's say the younger members of the EU in many ways have had an easier time complying with the single window mandate because they're starting from nothing or, or from something very, very simple and uh, now instituting the single window uh, solution all at one time. So, um, but, but, you know, virtually every country in Europe is, is either in the process of implementing it or, ha you know, having just completed it. So, and it, and again, it's for us as a company that's very involved in a lot of these different customs regimes, it's, it, you know, it, it's something we have to deal with. We just did a big project for, you know, for the Netherlands, for example, uh, there's a new uh, maritime single window that they initiated. So we had to, comply with that. So it's just something, it's just an ongoing process for a software company like us and others who are in our industry. Just, you just have to stay on top of it. Yeah. Not to, you know, we, talk, we always talk about, you know, going back to my opening comment, you know, it's, it's, it's supply chain management is rapid change and it's, you know, very, very dynamic environment. I think the global trade arena, um, whether it's from a regulation standpoint, which then ultimately trickles down to technology uh, requirements is, is constantly, uh, you know, constantly changing and, and, and evolving. Well, let's shift gears now and talk about, uh, you know, last mile logistics, right? Which is arguably, you know, the hottest, you know, area in the industry right now due to the growth of e-commerce and, and home delivery and, and so on. I mean, what are some of the key trends in this segment of the market uh, that companies need to have kind of their, you know, on their, on their radar, uh, you know, to, you know, be successful in it? Uh, there's 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 lots of things here we could talk about. There's a couple that are particularly uh, interesting for for me and I think for our readers. Um, you know the, the the first one that I'll mention is the crowdsourcing concept. You know this continues to be sort of uh, started, stopped, started, stopped in a lot of different areas, um, and uh, and and it's taking a lot of different forms. 
Um, but you know, the reality is there are literally hundreds now of, of little sort of crowdsourced last mile home delivery organizations. I mean, I think, uh, every other, you know, month I see a new, you know, del food delivery service that's available now. Um, and it's just an example of, of, of a form of last mile logistics, you know, bringing food to my door kind of thing. Um, so I think the, the crowdsourcing is really an interesting concept. And, it, and, and again, I think there's a degree to which the industry is, is starting to experiment with things and, and try to figure them out. And I, and I think what my own personal feeling is that you're going to see uh, us settle into kind of a, a, a two camp kind of, uh, kind of place. One is the larger retailers, for example, will develop their own kind of last mile crowdsource networks. And maybe they include employees coming to and from work, um, you know, or, or other, you know, other real common uh, transportation routes that they know they can rely on. And those will be centered around, you know, where the retail stores are located, obviously. Um, and I think you're going to see more and more of those. And uh, we, we are already seeing some of those. And, uh, but I think you're going to see, continue to see more of those, particularly as these companies start to realize that the standard, you know, brick and mortar business is, is just a really difficult business model to be uh, successful. in if that's your only business model. And so I think, you know, more and more shifting to uh, let the store inventory become part of my e-commerce fulfillment model. And therefore now I need to have a delivery mechanism to accommodate orders that are being sourced out of those retail locations. So I think that's one. The second one is, is you will, I think eventually we'll start to see a handful of companies really emerge as the crowdsourcing companies, you know, sort of the, the brand recognition and the market recognition that Uber has in the, in the, let's say the crowdsource taxi space. Uh, I think you're going to see a handful of companies really become the sort of the Uber esque uh, crowdsourcing solutions for, for last mile delivery. Um, so I think, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see those two things kind of emerge more clearly today. I think it's a bit of, a little bit of everything all over the place and, you know, things are tried and, you know, shut down and restarted and, and uh, you're still going to see some of that. But I think my feeling is it's going to really emerge in kind of those two camps. Now, um, have you seen anyone, you know, from a TMS standpoint saying, Hey, I want to plug into, you know, uh, you know, plug in, let's just, let's just use one example, a, a delive as, as, as a, as a carrier within my routing guide or, you know, are you seeing that those kind of conversations? Or to your point, I mean, I, I see the same thing. It's still kind of a lot of folks are still. There's a lot of experimentation going on. Even with the big retailers, I mean, they're doing their own thing, like you said. But they also have partnerships with some of these emerging players, and they're kind of putting their chips in in multiple locations until this kind of shakes out a little, a little bit. So I'm just wondering if it's still too early, you know, to say, okay, we're going to put some of these. Uh, uh, smaller startup or emerging uh, 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 last mile delivery guys as part of our TMS routing guide, or if you see that ultimately emerging. Yeah, I, I think it is still early. I mean, we, we uh, I don't know if you knew this when you asked the question, but we have worked with Delive and, and have added them into our solution, um, actually even into our parcel solution for that reason, because we knew there was companies that wanted to use them as a, a, effectively a parcel carrier. Um, so, but it really is a lot of experimentation still going on. I think and it's, it's difficult to say who ultimately will be the, you know, kind of the prevailing brands when this is all done, but, uh, but, but clearly it's going to happen. And, uh, the retail space I think is driving a lot of this retail e-commerce space, obviously driving a lot of this. Um, the other, the other thing, and it, and it goes really, I think very closely tied to the whole crowdsourcing thing is the notion of, uh, I'll just call it, you know, geolocation-based addressing. Um, I'm sure there's probably a better description for it, but, um, and, and this is actually becoming very, very popular in Europe right now. It's also in certain markets being heavily used in, in Asia, particularly in China. Um, and, and we actually use it some in the U.S. for specific industries. And the basic premise of this is, instead of having the service provider or the delivery uh, service come to a specific address, I want them to arrive at a geocode, the latitude, longitude, let's call it, and, and perform the service or make the delivery. Now, in the U.S., we're, we're kind of used to one of these businesses that, that does this today, um, and it's the, the auto glass uh, repair guys, right? And there, there's a couple of them out there, so I won't mention any of their names, but they, many of them will advertise, they'll come to your 
the business, they'll come to, you know, wherever you're located to, to repair glass on your automobile. So imagine an, a large office complex where you've got a parking lot full of, you know, thousand cars. How do they know which vehicle is yours and where to, where to go to, to find the vehicle if they're going to work on it while you're at work? So they're starting to use some of these alternative geolocation-based services. And the, the premise is I basically claim or identify a latitude longitude as the location. And then I expose that information to the service provider. And now all they have to do is reference that same set of geo coordinates and they know exactly where to make my delivery or to perform the service. In this case, maybe the auto glass repair. Um, so uh, there's a couple of these providers that have started to, to pop up. Uh, Lockpin is one. Uh, we've done some work with them. What three words is another one. Very interesting. Um, and a lot of there's there's more. So I won't. I don't mean to do disservice to those I didn't mention. But um, but a lot of them are being driven by little startups, uh, primarily in the European market. And um, and and I I think this is one major trend that is going to totally change the way we think of logistics today. Um, one example of this, and I I don't know if they're using any of these specific providers, but um, Domino's Pizza, and I'll just mention them. If you've noticed any of their commercials recently, they've been talking a lot about, you know, we can deliver your pizza wherever you are, you know, so you see the, the guy in the commercial, he's running through a park and, you know, he's handing pizza to somebody who's sitting in the park. And that idea that I can be anywhere and I can have my delivery brought to me um, and not be tied to an address, my home, my office, my, you know, whatever, is really, really fundamentally changing the industry. And it has a big impact on companies like us and, and, and those who use our technology because it means all the traditional ways that we thought about route optimization and all of this all relied on some kind of an address. Uh, and now, you know, the, the industry is moving away from addressing. Um, so it just has, it has huge ramifications to the technology, but it also has significant ramifications to the operational side of logistics. You know, delivering a pizza in a park requires completely different equipment than, for example, you know, delivering a pizza or, a, you know, or a pallet of pizzas to a distribution center. So, uh, you know, just the, the logistical side of it is, is going to obviously have to change along with it. But again, I think it's really tied to the whole crowdsourcing last mile thing, because as more and more people want that flexibility around what time of day they get the, the order, you know, delivered, what, you know, where they're going to be is just the secondary or the very natural uh, kind of counterpart to that. And, uh, and so we're seeing that more and more we've integrated with, uh, what three words, for example, into our application now, uh, so that we can allow customers to have that flexibility. So I, I don't know that we have anybody using it today, but my point is that this is where the industry is going. And, um, you have to be thinking about this from an operational perspective and you have to be thinking about it from a technological perspective as well. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, I had to, to be honest, I, that, that, this is this is new to me. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, I, th there were plenty of times that I was, uh, you know, coaching my my kids uh, Little League game or just watching a, a baseball game somewhere. And it, it would have been great to order, you know, a pizza or, or, or a, a sandwich or something and, and be able to just provide them my geocode location and, and, and uh, you know, enable that. But like you said, you know, there, there's things that then have to be enable from a technology standpoint and from an operational standpoint to be able to pinpoint and make that, that delivery to a place that doesn't have a traditional, you know, address. But absolutely, I mean, I think we as consumers are continuing to, you know, push the envelope on, on delivery. And, you know, a lot of times we're going to expect deliveries, you know, uh, where we may not be at a somewhere where we can give a specific address, right? We might be shopping, we might be uh, a tourist, uh, you know, we want something, you know, uh, uh, to, to, to be sent to us, you know, wherever. Um, so, so, so I think, uh, you know, I, I may, I may, I may steal this one for my predictions for, for next year, because I think this is a, uh, you know, you know, very thought provoking. I think some, something that, that does have, uh, you know, ramifications from an operational standpoint, and obviously from a technology standpoint, particularly, you know, TMS solutions, like you said, you know, when you think about how do you do route optimization, you know, tradition has been, you know, you put in, you plug in addresses and, um, and, and now you're, you're kind of doing it with, you know, you know, if, if the world is moving in this direction, it's going to have to be a, a, a you know, a different approach. Um, so, 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 you know, we're kind of running short on time here. So, um, could, you know, wh why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, what changes or innovations are happening then on the technology front, to, you know, to keep up with, with these trends. I mean, you talked a little bit about on the global trade front, you know, obviously all, all those regulations are then having impact on technologies. You talked a little bit about that, but 
you know, I guess more, more generally or higher level, I mean, what, what's, what are some of the things that then are happening on the technology front to, to respond more quickly to this? Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, uh, concepts that is really changing the way uh, software companies like Blue Jay and others uh, approach the market is, uh, is, is much more of a focus around, uh, you know, to use an old term, componentization or uh, containerization is, is kind of a new way to think about it in today's technology. Um, but the idea is more and more of, the, of what I bring to the market has to be built in such a way that it can be easily um, manipulated, easily exposed, easily connected to uh, lots of other little things that need to also be easily exposed, connected, and manipulated. So, um, you know, the traditional supply chain solutions of the past were, to be fair, were somewhat monolithic, large stack applications, um, you know, large implementations, they, they have, an, you know, a fairly drawn out uh, uh, process to, to, to get to know them and learn them and use them. And what we're seeing is that more and more customers are saying, look, you've got product A, product B, product C, and I need 20% of product A, I need 5% of product B and 12% of product C. Can you put that together for me? And if my, my A, B, and C products are monoliths, it's very hard to do that. It's hard to develop and implement a solution like that with a reasonable time frame and a reasonable budget for customers. So um, certainly we and, and others in our industry are you know, heavily moving towards this uh, very modular, very componentized, if you will, very service-based, uh, microservice-based solution architecture that allows you to kind of put together the combination of things that you need in, in almost any way that you can imagine. So the reality is as smart as, as I like to think we are as a company and, and others in our industry, we're going to have customers tomorrow who ask for things that we've never thought about. <laughs> it's just the way it is. And, and, and we welcome that. We don't want our, let's say, architecture to get in the way of responding to those, those requests when they come in. So I think the industry, the best thing for the industry at a very high level is to, is to move heavily in that direction because the reality is those monolithic applications of the past, it's not what people want or need, frankly. And those, those monoliths will just get in the way of providing the real solutions that the customers require. So, Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. I, I see the same thing. You know, you know, we talk about the, the, the need to, for, for agility and configurability and, and, and all that. And I think that, that trickles down to the actual architecture of these, the, you know, these technologies to be able to you know, more easily configure them and be able to, to, to enable workflows that, to your point, you know, uh, involves a little bit of this application, or what was historically application A, a little bit of what involves application B and C. But every customer is going to want to kind of put that in a slightly different way. And I think the other advantage that I see, uh, and which was actually one of my predictions from last year, one of the other advantages of, the, of this type of architecture is that it also enables customers to self-innovate themselves. Yes. Because if they're, as they become more easier to use and, and configure, more user-friendly, um, customers can configure their own solutions, right? So they don't have to wait upon the software provider or a consultant to come in and do it for them. Um, you know, they can have uh, people in house uh, without having to have, you know, uh, uh, PhDs in, in IT and all that, you know, do this as well. So I think that balance between, you know, continuous innovation on, on, the, on the part of the technology providers, because that's, that's always a must, but also the, giving the, 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 the customers the tools and the capabilities to, to self innovate, you know, with these uh, and create their own workflows with the tools that you provide them. So. Uh, absolutely. And, and we're, like I said, we know we're going to have customers coming up with combinations we've never thought about. And we, the last thing we want is, is impede that, you know, so the architecture can either support it or can impede it. One of the two. Um, right. But, uh, right. You're absolutely right. Give, give power to the people. I say. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So as a way to wrap up then, you know, in light of everything that we, we've, we've kind of talked about, you know, what action should then companies take, uh, you, you know, to make sure that they're well prepared to succeed and, 2019 and beyond. Yeah, so obviously, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, things are changing really, really rapidly, and it's very important you stay on top of those changes. Um, and we've, we've, as a company, just as an example, we've done a lot of work around trying to bring, uh, you know, distill down what's happening and turn it into educational materials for our customers. And I, and I know we're not the only ones doing that. So it's really important to stay plugged into what the people in the industry are, are uh, talking about and what's happening so that you can react when you need to react and be prepared to react. Um, and I think there are, 
you know, in, in these, each of these specific situations, Brexit as an example, there are mitigation strategies that you can employ to, to address those particular situations. And, and we encourage our customers, and I'm not going to go through what they are, but we have a whole session on what are some of the mitigation, mitigation tactics that you can use for, for Brexit in particular. So we encourage customers to, you know, number one, learn, learn about what's happening. Number two, explore mitigation strategies uh, or adaptation strategies, let's say. Um, and, and then, and obviously, uh, you know, work with the right technology providers, you know, and, and we're not, again, not the only ones in this space, but it's important to have uh, a partnership with a, a provider that can help you bridge that gap. So the mitigation strategy might be process, but it might also be technology and you just need to be in a position where you can, you can uh, react very, very quickly. So, uh, but it all starts with education and, and our, we encourage our customers, you know, to stay on top of things. We try to, as I said, bring as much content as we can to them. And, and that's, that's really the a very important first step. If you're, if you're not up on what's happening, you're going to have a really hard time adapting to it. I know it sounds very basic, but it's so easy in today's world with so much going on. We just get so focused on the task at hand. It's, it's easy to ignore all of the, the things that are happening around us and, and quite frankly, miss a big, a, a big opportunity. So. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. Obviously, that's, that's part of our goal and mission here at, at Talking Logistics is to help you know, educate you know, the, the, the industry and the market in terms of what, what's happening. And, and certainly I think we, we covered a lot of, a lot of ground, uh, you know, today. And like I always say, you know, we always manage to scratch the surface on, on these topics, but I think, uh, you know, we gave uh, folks some, some good food for thought on, on some important, tr you know, trends that are happening in the industry and, and some good, uh, you know, advice to, you know, uh, for them to take away with. So uh, Doug, uh, again, thank you for uh, making the time to be with us today. You're welcome. Thank you, Adrian. And thanks to your viewers. Great. I want to thank those of you that joined us. Uh, if you're watching this episode on demand, uh, either at the uh, Blue Jay website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for Doug, uh, you can post it there, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.